and you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. All right, so, and I just wanna say welcome Robin. Thanks for coming today. Um, just wanted you to be, I just wanted to say hi to you real quick. All right, so basically today we're gonna to have a discussion and I wanted you to know that, um, okay. I can let people in. Can you let people, okay, great. Okay, so we're gonna get started. And um, the goal of this is to be a discussion. So at any moment, uh, you can basically put questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself and talk and you can just interrupt me at any time. Please feel free, I do this in my classes. My name is Leilanda Maines. I'm an affiliate faculty at many institutions, but I am here today on behalf of Front Range Community College, the Westminster campus. I teach online, hybrid, and face-to-face -face classes. So let's go ahead and dive in. And I wanted to say I'm a tech mentor at Front Range um, during the beginning of the semester. And so this is where I kind of started seeing some issues that people were having, and that is good. And it says that my screen sharing is paused. So let me just resume the screen sharing. Is that correct? Okay, so let's move forward if it will let me. There we go. So. When I look at, uh, I came across this quote when I went to an equity conference recently, and it said, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And I felt like that really resonated with me. And I started, I was already kind of on that road, but I felt like this quote really represented that for me. And so when looking at my teaching philosophy and the pedagogy that I do in my classes, I kind of center it around this. And I'm going to lower this. Okay. So, what do I care about? So, when looking at my teaching philosophy, I want to empower and inspire students to be better. And I used to think that I should say better at something, but then I realized I don't really have to. Just having them be better is important. Now, I teach about, I actually right now can teach six to different, different six to seven different subjects in biology. So this is just some of the subjects that, that I teach. And in looking at this, you can see bio 202 and 201 are higher level biology classes. And then you have like your bio 111, which is your majors and some non-majors and then non-majors courses. And so basically I decided using backward design that I wanted all of my students to, to develop certain skill sets but also to have the fundamental knowledge depending on where they were going. Now, my majors, it's always going to the next one. As far as my non-majors, that's a little bit trickier, but I want them to still be critical thinkers, right? And I want them to understand how science relates to their everyday lives. And so because of that, um, that's kind of where a lot of my, what I'm doing came from. So this right here is, a, you can click the link or whatever you'd like to do with the PowerPoint later, is if you go to this, this was about 13 different skills that were wanted in 2021 in the workforce. So if you see them, a lot of them should be pretty like understandable, but there is one where you're like, there are a few of them where I was like, oh, I didn't even realize that, you know? So I would say emotional intelligence is one of those where I was like, okay, I could totally see that, but never when I was growing up did anyone ever talk about, you know, this being a thing, you know, can I handle my emotions, but also can I pick up on other people and see, figure out how they're doing? Uh, those were things that I was never taught growing up, right, um, in school. Now I was taught those things, I was taught that, you know, later in life, but it wasn't something that I was ever thinking about. That creativity portion, um, looking at some of these skills, being adaptive, and then looking at the technology was kind of one of the things that I wanted to just kind of say like, wow, these are, these were things that they were really looking at that you're like, I would never have, I wouldn't have thought of, but technology has become a big and bigger piece, okay? So 
these right here are my things that I will be looking at. And at any time you can ask questions, you can have discussions, you can post things in the chat, whatever that looks like for you, okay? So as far as my teaching pedagogy, I look at these four things. So I'm looking at course alignment and design, uh, my rapport and connection with my students, classroom management, and also looking at a pandemic clause that I made, okay? So we're gonna be able to have conversations from this. So when looking at this quote, technology is a useful servant, but a dangerous master. So technology is really great and it can be really useful. The hardest part is making sure that you're using it to help you. And just because it's helpful for someone else doesn't mean that it's gonna be used the same for you. And so this is something that I noticed as a tech mentor that wasn't necessarily, um, sometimes people would think of doing something but it didn't really match their course. So for me, I do this by backward design. So when I look at my course alignment, I'm using backward design. And I thought that this picture really illustrated. Um, so my goal is looking at how those students, like how will my students be different when they leave my course? Because the content, especially in my content heavy subject matters, the content isn't really changing. I mean, yes, it does kind of move forward a little bit, but I would say I've been teaching for 10 and a half years now and the content that I've been teaching is pretty much very similar to what it was when I first started teaching, but the students are not. And I feel like when you're teaching, no matter what class you teach, um, no matter what semester you're gonna, the students are gonna be different. So what are they leaving with? And so for me, I've really decided that based off the, the content, the subjects that I'm teaching, but also I like to think that I do it based off the, um, I always have like what I want my students to get out of it. And if they get more out of it, that's great. So I do want them to have those skills that are marketable that will help them to be successful and be better in their lives. But they also, if they're going up to upper level biology or even nursing programs, they do need the fundamental level of understanding. And so when I'm looking at this, and this is where we'll get to the pandemic clause where it becomes really important because during the pandemic, the students have really been struggling. And a lot of the struggle is they're working a lot of hours. Um, mentally, the pandemic has really been hard on everyone. So some of them are just having really hard times, whether they're depressed or um, they're just having a hard time staying focused, things of that nature. Now, I will say that these activities, the, the activities that I'm doing, so when I get to my pandemic clause, I will talk about I had to cut out some activities to make them, and so we'll get to that. I cut out some activities to be more intentional, I should say. So what I've done, we'll just, we'll just kind of get into that if there are no questions. So course alignment and design. It's really important that when you go and they're like, oh, let's try something new. You want to make sure, and I, I, you know, I've had the quality matters training, and I've had the backward de design training and active learning training. And I will say one thing that's important about course alignment is that it can vary. Um, the alignment itself doesn't vary, but it could vary based off what you're using it for, like what you're going to do. So, for instance, in my Bio 111 hybrid, when I set up my modules, because I do modules. Um, I set them up by weeks. Now, I don't always set everything by weeks. So you'll see in a moment for my bio uh, 202, I set it actually up by units. And even though I'm, I'm still doing this, I basically know that I'm just gonna, I just, I know that I'm be doing that. Okay, so let's look at the next thing. So inside of those weeks, you will find that I have a checklist, which I found to be very helpful, my students do too. And then I have a read and explore. And so if you go into that do section, it looks something like this. So this is a way that I'm able, my students are able to stay with what's happening online. And I feel like that's been really helpful for me, just keeping it organized and aligned and um, that helps them so they can stay focused. My checklists are always hyperlinked. And then if you look at my bio 202 course, I basically have things set up as units. And then with inside of here, you will find that there'll be like a read and explore and a do section, kind of similar to my other classes. So what I've decided is based on my the, the, the content and me being that expert in my experience, I, I kind of have framed my classes in that way. All right. 
So I wanted to bring this question to the audience. Why do students come to class? So you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself, whatever works best for you. So I'm gonna go into the chat. At least I thought I was going into the chat. Let me, are you able to see the chat? You're uh, split off because you're presenting. So you'll find it in a little box, but you should be able to find the chat uh, button probably under more. With so the I did box. that, but it did not, I'm sorry. Okay, so I thought, can you read to me what the chat said? Yeah, so um, Susan Ashley is saying um, uh, to get credit for the course, uh, Robin is saying for the engagement. Okay, yeah, so those are all really good reasons why students would come to class. So one of the things that I noticed is that I wanted to make sure if my students were coming to class, I wanted to make sure it was worth their time. And so something that I was able to do or something that many of you might already be doing, which I should already ask. Let's take a moment. Um, can I ask you why you came today? You don't have to say their names, but if okay. you if you had a particular question or something that you wanted me to go over, I just want to make sure that I hit that, or we could just do a discussion based off that. So if you guys don't mind, if you if you have that, but if you don't, that's fine. I'll just keep going. I just want to make sure I was being respectful of your time because that's a that's a thing now, right? As educators not not seeing any comments yet okay cool so one thing i noticed is that i if i wanted my students to keep coming to class especially during the pandemic i noticed that what i needed to do was i needed to keep them engaged right and not only keep them engaged but making them want to come back and so when looking at this if you look at rapport this is from the Webster's Dictionary. Um, looking at this as far as a, characterized by an agreement, mutual understanding and empathy. And I feel like this is one of the ones that I've had to do a lot during the pandemic. Empathy is huge. And I needed to, to make sure that they understood that we were all struggling and that I wanted to be there for them. And in doing that, what I would like to say is, in all of my classes, I have over a 98% retention and attendance rate. Now, what did I have to do? There, there are some examples below of things that I did. So one, I use polls. I use a website called minty.com, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, I also use Google Sheets when I get into breakout rooms or as a review. Now, we will also talk about breakout rooms and then we'll talk about some hot topics, okay? Some of those hot topics are gonna to be things that we are just debating all over the place with in academia, okay? Um, I did have, sometimes I just will have a conversation with my students. We'll spend five to six minutes when we first get there just to break the ice. And it seems like they've had a bad day or no one's really being interactive. And I'm feeling that we might need to talk, just, you know, just have some like, hey, how's your day? What is anyone doing anything fun this weekend? And I know like it's time. I know time is a huge thing um, as an instructor, but taking that time I think is really helpful. Now, another thing, cause we'll get to the being proactive. I mean, we'll get to the uh, engagement of polls and Google Sheets and things of that nature is I like to be proactive. So something I do is I have an action plan that I do. So if I notice that a student has gotten behind or isn't um, hasn't logged in in a while, I actually email them out. And then if they've gotten behind, I just try to check in with them and see if they would like to try to catch up. And if so, we work on a plan. And so we actually get their schedules out and we, we say, okay, you gotta do this by this date. And it, it's been really helpful. I mean, there are so many students who probably would not have completed my classes that are completing the class because of the action plan. I've actually had people try to do more than one action plan. And I'm like, no, we just do it one time. We don't wanna, you know, I, I need to be fair to everyone, right? Um, also, I feel like video announcements, just checking with my students has really given us a connection being um, for my online students and for my face-to-face -face or remote, I guess, because we don't really do a lot of face-to-face -face in hybrids. 
um, having that is just a good way to keep us connected. And that has been really good. So I did notice at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I still had a decent retention rate, but I was really upset because I had a lot of students that were leaving my course. And I was like, what's going on? Is it me kind of thing, you know? And then what happened was uh, I started implementing these new things uh, that I talked about and that I'll keep talking about with the pandemic uh, clause that I made. So let's go ahead and look at, so this is an example of minty.com. So this will be one of the questions that they would have. They can access this via their phone or they can access it via computer, either or works. And it's completely anonymous and it lets you know on the corner here how many people have actually voted. So sometimes I will tell people, oh, you know, we, we until we get to 75% of the class, I can't move on. And then, you know, usually those last few people who are trying to decide what to do will do that. So a word to describe your day, maybe your week. And this is just a way for them. I've noticed it's a way for them to kind of, I know us to start with to, to feel more connected. So we also have, I sometimes do, I'll do a second question. And the second question is gonna be content related. So I kind of use it as a way to, a stepping stone to move on to new information. And so at that point in time, uh, as you can see here, this is my bio 202 class. This was a question I asked them, it's completely anonymous. And, you know, I'm able to look at based off what they have. And then I was able to use this to then when I go into teaching to make sure that I cover in, make sure that I am anything that was not correct, that I'm able to take care of that right then. And it's anonymous, so the students don't feel like a lot of pressure from it. So they, this has been really good. Now you don't have to use minty.com. They have a lot of, they have a, I use the free version, but you can also use like poll every, everywhere. You have polls inside of WebEx, you have polls inside of Zoom. Uh, if you're using Microsoft Teams, you can um, use SharePoint to do things like when you're lecturing. So I just want you to, uh, there are tons of other options that you can do. I just chose Minty because it seemed to work well. And I really like the different colors that it has. And then, uh, Rolanda, we have a, yeah. a comment. Um, okay, it cool. says a video announcements have been a great addition for teacher presence. Both faculty and students are finding this to be something they want to keep even post COVID. Yes. I found that it is great. Like I, you know what? I just feel like it connects us. I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you. Sometimes I send my students like dog pictures or little cats and dog and cats together or animals or, you know, little cute stuff. And they're always like, oh my goodness, but they love it. I hear stuff later. They're like, I get emails from students like, thank you so much for sending that. Like it just made my day, you know? And it, it, it's a little things. Um, Sometimes if I get to, to go outside and I take a walk, I'll take my students with me. I'll do a little use your video and it'll be me at the park and I'll talk to them. And, you know, I just think that sometimes you just want to have that connection. And I feel like if students have that connection, they're more likely to stick with it. And you can um, ask more of them because they trust you and they're gonna like be willing to dig deep into the content. So I totally agree with that. And I love it. I love it. Um, so this right here is an example of, and I'm having a little bit of trouble. This is an example of a Google Sheet. If you want, I can easily stop sharing and get back into PowerPoint mode um, and not be in slideshow mode. Let me see. So you can see it. Um, we'll keep that for now. So let's see. So I'm going to get back out. So here we go. So if I look at this right here, you can move these around which is so helpful. I just spent, and so you move them around and then you just place them. So for this right here, I would be looking at the blood type. And so I can move this over. And it's really interesting. I split my students up into groups and why is it not moving? Of course it's not moving because we're recording, okay? And so you split students up into groups and I said, okay, like, let's do this. And then you have to talk about antibodies and antigens. Now, I don't wanna go in too much into that because that's not what we're here for. But I just wanted to say that this right here alone, uh, we had split into breakout rooms and we did this. And there were so many students who just knew they knew what was going on. And after we did this, they did not, I could, they did not know. I mean, after we did this, they knew, but before that it did not, it was not good. Like they were not doing well. 
And, but the good thing was that when they worked on in groups, they had, I gave them an assignment that this was one part of it. And there was other things they had to do too. They didn't have any active work, just them talking and getting to, um, getting into the information. And it was just, I feel like these have been helpful, but I will say one thing, when we get to our hot topics, we'll talk about breakout rooms. And I will say breakout rooms can be great, but I do believe, I, I'm just gonna be honest in my classes, I have a class that when I put them in breakout rooms, they do absolutely nothing. And when I mean nothing, I mean nothing. And you just can't force it. You know what I mean? Like you can definitely put the mannerisms in there. And so because they aren't as active in breakout rooms, I actually do more whole class work with them. So we're interactive together as a group and not necessarily broken into to smaller groups and breakout rooms. But a lot of my other classes, we will do breakout rooms. So when looking at the classroom, I would say that I do all of these things that you see here. Um, I don't necessarily, because I do want this to be a, a discussion and I do want to get to the hot topics, which I think will be really great. I would say um, K through 12, I, I got to do, um, I went to the PBL for K through 12 and in that they were talking about these lesson plans and even though I'm higher ed, I was like, what's this all about this lesson plan and so, you know, learning more about it, I did, I did start implementing lesson plans but they're very short and they have room for space because I want this to be more um, adaptive and I need it to be flexible. Even if I'm teaching the same class, whether it be online, hybrid or remote right now, I need my lesson plan to, to be able to, to grow in case we have really good discussions. Cause there have been times where we'll have really amazing discussions and I'm like, oh my goodness, they're learning in this moment. I know I need to get to this other thing, but I should stay in this moment with them because this is a teachable moment and I can use this. And it does mean that I have to revise like the next time we meet or things like that. But the good thing about technology is that you can put things online, not more homework. So that's what, and we'll get to that in a moment. A lot of times I think that when people are, um, how do I say it? When people, when we take things away, like we don't give things over class, we're like, oh, we'll just give it to them as homework or uh, we will give it to them so that they have it due. So before they come to the next class, they're gonna turn it in. And I'm gonna be honest with you that they have a lot. Like I've actually took time with my students and asked them how many classes they're taking and how much homework they have. And you would be really, really shocked at how much homework that they're supposed to do online or just do period. And then they're also supposed to attend class. And I just feel like sometimes the students are just getting overworked. And that's something we'll talk about um, when we get to, um, we'll get to a little bit of that of why I made my pandemic clause. Um, I like to use jokes and humor and quotes that fit my personality. I can, I think I'm pretty bubbly. Maybe you don't see it right now, but I am. Uh, we do interactive outlines, which are skeletal outlines, depending on where you were taught. I use smart books currently because I use uh, McGraw-Hill, but I'm trying to work on um, open educational resources because it would be really nice to not have to have the students have to pay for certain things. So um, that's what I've been looking at, but it can be very difficult as an affiliate faculty, but that's okay because I'm still going to try to do it. Um, I do a scaffolding process. So whatever we talked about the previous class, I tend to go back over and I do formative assessments, whether they're in class, I do in class activities, or I will sometimes do very short assignments that they can turn in, but I really am trying to be mindful. And this is where, um, when I got to my pandemic clause, this is where it really, it really got real for me anyway. Um, so I had to like, take some things out that I really liked, but we'll talk about that in a moment. In a moment, And I really try to be transparent with them in the class, whether it's via my online class or my, my remote classes. Um, I think it's important to let them know what is the goal and why are you doing this? Um, because if you do that, then they are willing. If you have that rapport, you have that connection, they're willing to go the mile with you. But if they don't understand why you're doing something, I feel like sometimes students will become resistant. And if you're asking them to do something outside of the normal realm of what they've learned, 
So I would like to say it can be really hard when students are taught to a test and then we're, we're asking them, yes, you get this grade, but that grade doesn't really matter and it matters what you learn. And they're like, no, I need this grade to get into a nursing program or to, to get into whatever they're trying to do next, right? And so that grade becomes so important that it kind of overshadows that learning. And I just had to have a conversation with my anatomy class recently. And I said, you know what? Um, if you don't learn this, when you get into a nursing program, you're gonna struggle. You're gonna have a really hard time just because I was like, they're gonna go over this stuff really quickly and then they're gonna go over what they want you to learn. And I, I think that it's really important for them to know. So I do this with all of my classes because um, even if they're non-majors, for my non-majors, I usually tell them, I say, you know what? There's real life implications here. So let's understand this in case you ever come across this in real life. And then when your doctor says something, you actually understand what they're talking about. So my pandemic clause. So the two things that I had to do during the pandemic that I would say, I, I did change my course design and I had to change some things here or there, but this was the two biggest things that I have done that I feel like have really helped my classes and um, have helped my students. And I would say my pass rates are really high. My retention rates are high. My attendance rates are high. And I, I think this has a little bit to do with it. So deadlines. We have to have deadlines. We can't not have deadlines. But what I'm saying is that there are times you can go into your course management system and on the next slides, I'll show you in your class progress, depending on what you're using, that you can go in and you can look to see. Um, not only can you just go into grades and look to see how many students have turned something in, but you can also go through um, class progress and you can see what's happening with the students, what, how active they are, what's going on. You can just take some time and look at that. And if I notice that maybe half the class or I see that they're really struggling and they have like a day to turn this in and most of the class has not, I will decide based off the assignment whether I think it's more important to keep the deadline and have my students not turn it in or push back the deadline a day or two and have more students turn it in and probably be grateful. And what I've decided is due to the successes that I've had by due to the, sorry, due to the successes that I've had, I just go ahead and push it back because it has been, I mean, recently, I'll be honest with you, I had a deadline and I, I extended it by two days in my anatomy two class and I had a student, I had not even thought about it, who said, thank you so much for extending that deadline. She's like, it's been so hard because I live in Boulder and because of the shooting, it's been really, you know, it's just, we everything has been in chaos right now for me. And I would never have known that, right? I, I don't know, I don't know where all my students live because that's not something that they normally tell you, right? Where they're living. And so I didn't realize that by me just pushing this back two days, how much this re this helped her. And she's like, I had already been working on it, but I just been through so much. I just was having trouble. And now this is where we think about our students and we say, the student could have just emailed you, right? And the student could have just emailed me and said they needed more time. But by me being proactive and saying, you know what, I'm noticing that it may not, and that's just one student. There are other students that obviously that helped. And I continually get these emails every time. Now, with the deadline thing, I just want to make sure that doesn't mean that I'm extending all deadlines all the time. I just want to clarify that. You need to decide what, what is important to you. Now, because I'm also getting rid of some of my assignments, which is our B over here. And if you guys have any questions about this, let me know. Um, because I'm also getting rid of some of my assignments, and I had to do this. This was a hard conversation that I had with myself. Because let's be honest, as educators, we really like the stuff we put up, right? <laughs> so if you're like me, I like the stuff I put up. There was a lot of time put into that. It's important, right? But I noticed that my students would send me emails about, you know what, my other class has assigned like five things that I have to do in this week. 
And I'm also, I'm taking three other classes besides that one, plus your class. And it's just like, wow, I didn't even think about it. So because someone else is assigning a lot of stuff, now this student that maybe they wouldn't have assigned if we were in regular remote classes, right? So, I mean, regular face-to-face, -face, they, they would have done these uh, some of these things in class or they would have had these interactions. And I'm not saying this is everyone, but I'm saying that I've had a lot of this happen in the last year where I've, I'm like, oh my goodness, like that's a lot of assignments. And I can't change what the other instructor is doing. But if I want them to be successful in my class, then I need to think about what does that look like? And so what I did is I actually went through my content and I decided what are important. I use backward design for this. So I said, what are gonna be important activities or concepts or things that they must know when they're leaving my course to be successful in either the next course that they're taking or just it's gonna be good for them to practice some of those muscles that they're not used to practicing, right? And so what I have done is I, I've probably gotten rid of now, I've gotten rid of in each of my different units, I get rid of about two to three assignments. And what I've started doing is I either get rid of it whole, all together and I say, you know what, I have, a, I have a little place, like I don't know if you guys get to, if you guys got to check out the Marie Kondo approach a presentation. If you did not, please check it out. It's really awesome. So I kind of did a little like that where anything that I'm not able to use right now, because I just don't think that one, my students can handle it or that I'm merging with other assignments. I put off to the side and I say, come back to you when we're in face-to-face -face because it really is a harder environment now if students aren't used to being virtual. As someone who teaches online classes, I'm aware that it is different for students. And I've heard so many times where students say, I'm just not good at online. And I'm like, no, they're actually the learning modality. You could be great at online. It's just, you have to get used to it. It's about time management, and other things. And so what I've done is I've been modifying assignments um, and putting them together and then making them shorter. And sometimes I do more thought questions. So I'm asking them to be more thinking. Other times it's more just entry level blooms. But I do try to, if I get to meet with them, whether if it's a hybrid, um, then I do try to do some of that higher level and lower level in class when we meet so that we're still getting some of that. But what I've done is I've basically I think it's important for us to decide and be intentional about what assignments are very important to us, okay? And I wanted to show you this. So this is the class progress. I don't know if you're at FRCC, this is where it would be. And if you are at CCD um, and FRCC, you can look in, if you have D2L, you should be able to look under course admin and you will see this class progress right here. So you can use that, all right? And if you're in Canvas, Canvas has a few different options. So if you, uh, I know a lot of universities use Canvas. And so you can go here, you can look at some progress of your students, but you can also go to your analytics and you can look at more stuff if you want, okay? And I think that it's really great to just have a, I'm not saying spend hours, that's not what I'm saying, but it can be helpful to just kind of look in there. I do like checks, like I do one, if we have a semester, a 15 week class, I usually do like four where I'll check in on my students. Um, and I think that they like that. And I also even use, if we go back, I'm just gonna go back one. So in this under course admin, there's something, and I'm just gonna write it here because I have the worst handwriting. So that's, there's these things called intelligent agents, which I've talked about before. And for those, like I like to use those in case students are, um, if I know that like, hey, it's coming up and maybe my students forgot because it, you know, we just had spring break, I will send that out to the students. And if you ever want to know any, like go into deeper of any of this stuff, please let me know. I am more than happy to go into all this stuff. All right. So the hot topics. So this is where we're at. So breakout rooms, to use breakout rooms or to not use breakout rooms is the question. I think that you need to decide based off what you're trying to do. So when you look at your class and you say, what would I like the students to leave with? I think that's active learning is going to be great always. Well, not always like active learning done properly 
will always be great. Active learning done for the sake of active learning, well, it's kind of questionable about that. So like I said, I use breakout rooms, but there I don't do them all the time. I don't think that it's bad to do them all the time. I just think that it can be really hard for um, if your class isn't, for some reason, their culture, they're having trouble with the breakout rooms, or if I haven't established it well in that class, or there could be so many different factors. And so because of that, I would say that breakout rooms are awesome. And whenever I can get my classes to successfully do it, it's great. And I love it. And they like it and they learn and it's great. And we use our Google um, Sheets and we're just doing, being active, we're talking. Um, sometimes I use breakout rooms just for conversations. So we'll break out and we'll have these really good conversations. And I have noticed that sometimes I won't go in the breakout room when we're having huge conversations. I will wait and we'll come back together and I will have a note taker in each room and they we will all talk. Um, because I noticed that sometimes when I come into the breakout room, they all stop talking and the, the videos come off, right? Videos are no longer on, they stop talking. And you know, the one of my students said it's because the parents are in the room. And so I was like, oh, I never even thought about that, you know? And so um, I saw that there was a chat, but um, let me just click that real quick. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Just click it open. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, for some reason, the chat isn't opening on my side, so that's okay. I'll get I'll get in there. I promise. Um, are there any questions or people just? There, there is one uh, comment. When you use Google Sheets, do you create one for each group? So I do. I do create one for each group. Um, what I actually do is I create two separate documents. And what I've started doing, I'm not okay. So. What I've started doing is because I'm not as familiar with Google Sheets, I've actually taken all of my things I create within Google and I put them into PowerPoint. I know that sounds weird, it's so true. And so what I do then is I just send it, I post it online for them and in their D2L shells. And then I let them access like one person, all people can access it. And then only one person needs to share within their groups. And I will say that when they have to share, some people, uh, if they're using a Mac, they might have trouble in breakout rooms sharing. Um, also the same thing with Chrome, so you have to be careful. Uh, so sometimes I say, if you can't share, just make, make sure you're talking and I can we can all see what you're doing because you can go in that way. So if I'm doing it as a Google Sheet, I, I, I wanna go in, I can see everything they're doing. If I change it and I put it into um, PowerPoint, then it's no longer active in that way. So I can't see what they're all doing, but I know that I'm gonna come together. And I usually go into the breakout rooms if I'm using PowerPoint at that time, if I choose to use that instead. So that's what I usually do. I think it's really great because it's, but you gotta do um, two separate ones. So I usually do group, group one or group two or group A or group B, and then I tell them which group they are. And then we can go back over it as a class. And we just, I just click on group, one and then I click on group two and then we can kind of concise with everyone because I think that's really nice if you're not having them go in and out of breakout rooms and exchanging the information so um because some students are still very nervous and so they don't necessarily like to to talk out loud you know like I mean they'll talk out loud amongst other students but then when you get the big class back together they tend to to be very shy so um I will say with cheating software I tend to use alternate methods, okay? So um, alternate methods I use are going to be, I go in and uh, my testing. So because I have to give like, you know, the, the unit test and the content test, right? Um, what I do is I, I'm not gonna focus on recording them. And I like to give the students about four to five days at their convenience to take the exam. And so what I've done is I use question pools. And if you don't know how to use those, please let me know. I'm more than happy to share, like go in and show you any of these things I'm talking about. Um, but question pools are so great. And if you've already made the test online, the really great thing is you can just import it. 
So I know it looks like it's gonna take a lot of time, but it may not take as much time. And by using the pools, so what I would suggest if you're gonna use pools, I tend to use pools no more than, I would say 10 in a pool, but I may have several questions. So like um, sections. So I may have like eight sections and each of them might have 10, you know, 10 questions total. And of that, I'm only using like maybe four or five of those questions. So that way, and you, you can also make sure that you can click. It says uh, on, the, on the actual exam, if you're using D2L, you can go in and you can click and, it, and tell it that they can't, if you don't want them to be able to leave a, a certain window. So you could do like, I want them to be able to do three questions. And then once they've done those three and they submit, they can't go back. So I usually tell my students, I don't let them go back. And so I say, this is the amount of time you need. This is how many questions. Good luck and you know you can do it. And um, they seem to do it. I don't have to worry about them cheating. If I ever find that I'm grading, because I do, I do all formats. So I do true and false matching. Um, I do short essay questions, um, fill in the blank. And so if I ever find that I'm noticing that the short answer sections are very similar, then I do go back. And the cool thing you can do is you can go back and look at the IP address. And you can also go back and look at every single time that you can look at the length of time they were in the exam. You can look at how long it took them to answer the different questions. And if you, if I find someone else is, you know, had similar answers, I'll go in and look at when they did it and how long they spent. And if I ever have a situation where two students were doing it at the same time, around the same time, I, I message them and, and, and then, you know, things are gonna get real, right? Um, so I feel like that's something that I've done in the past. Um, it's up to you. I mean, there's been, I've gone to so many equity things lately and they say that sometimes due to the cameras, um, people are gonna have more anxiety, the student, and so that's gonna affect how they test. They say that sometimes with the cameras, um, on them, sometimes it doesn't recognize this, but based off the color of your skin, it may not fully recognize you. And so it says you're not who you are or that you left or, you know, there are so many things and I know they're getting better. So you do what you wanna do. You know, I'm just saying that I choose to do the question pools in sections and I'm just saying I time my exams and I have I have had no, I haven't had any problems really. I had, I did have a problem in my human bio class once where I was like, oh, really? So I had to take care of that. But most of the other ones, I've not had problems with students cheating and working together for the exam. And uh, I think that that's been positive on my end. I will say something else and then I will um, move on is that I also just started doing testing to mastery. So if you wanna know more about that, I basically have a part A version, which is multiple choice, and um, true and false. And then I have a part B, which is more synthesis questions. And I usually give them about 30 minutes for the one and about uh, 60 minutes for the other one. And it's been really, they can take the A and limited times, but I try to make sure that I have my pulls, but that, so that way, even though they're taking it again, they're not getting all the same exact questions, which I think is really helpful. But I try to make sure that I don't put any questions that I absolutely love on the part A. I wanna make sure, I mean, I love all my questions, but you know what I mean? Like in case like they get out on uh, Quizlet and all that kind of stuff. All right, so with our last seven minutes that we have, I just wanted to mention um, cameras on, cameras off. There's the big debate. I think you should do whatever you feel comfortable with, but I will say that I never require my students to have the camera on or off. I mean, I don't care. I tell them you do whatever you feel is comfortable for you. But I say, if you're eating a big dinner, you might, we're gonna stare at you while you eat. So it's up to you, which one do. And um, I will notice that the students just do what they want. Like I notice when we go into breakout rooms, they will all turn their videos on. Sometimes I have classes where they'll all turn them on or they'll all be off the whole time. And all I care about is, are they engaged? Are they actively pursuing the chat? Are they talking with me? Are they, because if they're doing those, and I even started using, I don't know if you know this, but in Zoom, WebEx, um, Teams, they all have the reactions now. So I tell them, 
I was like, let's just start using reactions. So I, I do thumbs up. I tell them to give me smiley faces, all that kind of stuff. And so I feel like that's a way to get them engaged and be active because sometimes I had students say, I can't turn my camera on for whatever reason. And I don't want them to feel like bad because they can't turn their camera on. But I think you need to do what's best for you. Cause I do think that students do enjoy having their cameras on but I do think that there is a accessibility issue there too. So I will say course vigor um, versus rigor. I have a short video on that. So um, are there any other questions right now before we go to that quick video? Uh, nothing right now. Okay, so we're gonna go to the video in a moment, but before we do that, I wanna just talk about less grades. So the less grades kind of goes back with my pandemic clause. And I just wanna say that it was really hard. It's really hard to look at your course and say, what can I take out? What is okay that if, if I don't have a grade on this? Um, and I also had to look and say, what can I give them credit for that will not, and I use a weighted system, so I need to preface that too. I use a weighted system, so I just wanna make sure you understand that. That if whatever's in that percentage, it, some of these grades aren't really gonna make a big difference. Does that make sense? Um, and so I, I, but I noticed that with using formative assessments where they're getting credit for doing things, that there was less pressure, and I felt like they were they were doing better, and I felt like more people were doing it, and then they became more active in class because we could then use that as a stepping stone. And I feel like that was that's kind of where I want to be and this vigor this video on rigor versus vigor is kind of going to talk about that so let's do that um okay so I'm gonna go here all right so here's our video I'm gonna go down all right can everyone see that yeah you want to make sure that your camera sound is on Yep, I have education. It. Many folks think about the word rigor. I like to think about it as vigor. Vigor is about bringing life to learning. It's about lighting a fire for a child. It's about allowing them to dig deep with passion and energy. It's providing depth over breadth. And it's giving children the opportunity to explore something in a way that is without boundary. It allows for the study of content across curriculum. It allows for hands-on and it allows for divergent paths to be followed. Okay, so I, I just feel like that sums up for me. Um, that basically sums up what I'm trying to do. And I do think that technology can be helpful. Um, technology is a use can be a useful servant, but a dangerous master. But I think that it can be, depending on how you implement it, it can be really great and can and can help you. So I use my technology to to help me when I can't be with my students. But I don't want it to be such a thing where it's a handicap. And I think that that's kind of where we are these days, where we're trying to figure out how can we decide what to do. So when looking at this, I would say some things that I've come across that I'm gonna to go to the audience in a moment is that I've had instructors who are like, I would, I saw this cool thing. I would like to add checklists. And I'm like, okay, well, what kind of checklist you wanna add? And they're like, I have no idea. And I'm like, okay, well, let's look at your class. Or they're like, I acquired this class. I have to do discussion boards, but I'm not really sure how to do them, right? And I'm like, okay, well, I'm looking at this discussion board and it's really long. And it, you have like eight of these and your semester is only 10 weeks. I was like, so are you giving the students downtime? Because these questions, they're a lot. And I asked them also, well, if you have all these questions in here, how successful is your students? What's your retention look like, okay? And so I think that those things are, are kind of important. And let me just stop sharing so that I can come to the, hi, um, I saw something in the chat. Okay, all right. So I basically just wanted to um, talk about those things and I hope that you enjoyed the, you're enjoying the conference. I know that I definitely am. Um, and do you guys have any questions for me?
Well, Leilanda, I, I really like um, your open mindedness and your approaches to uh, being flexible with your students, especially during the pandemic. I think um, personally, that's one of the probably the best approaches because you, like your your one student said with I'm also in Colorado and with the, the shooting that we had in Boulder, that was that was very tragic and it um, hit very close to home because it is so close to Boulder is so close in proximity to where your college is and even where my college is. So um, it, it was, it was hard hit, you know, so just understanding that meeting your students where they're at um, can really go a long way. Well, yeah. And I was going to say, um, if you guys, I will put my email in here. If you ever want to discuss anything, I'm always learning new things and I love to, I'm all about helping my students. Like I want to empower them. I want to inspire them. And I feel like the only way to do that is like you said, to meet them where they're at and to make sure that I am there for them. And I just, I think the biggest thing I can tell you is just, just, you know what? Self-care is important. Don't do all these things at once. If I can tell you anything, don't do everything at once. And then the other thing would be, you know, you got this, but I would definitely listen to yourself and to your students. And maybe even you can have a feedback in some way that can help you to understand where your students are so that you can be able to do things to kind of support and help them. Because I know I, ton I there are tons of times I have students out because they're sick with COVID, right? And then it's like, well, what do you do? And then you have to figure out a plan for them. And I was like, so what if I just give space in my course that anyone, it doesn't matter if you're sick with COVID, you're working a lot, um, there's space between those weeks when things are due or due every two weeks. And then sometimes I open up the whole entire semester, not semester, sorry, the whole entire unit. I'll open up the whole unit for them so they know exactly everything you have to do so they can plan it out. And I found that that can be really helpful too. But I can't do that in all my courses, right? So I just want to thank you guys so much for attending. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you, Leilanda. It was a great session. Um, okay. Don't forget to uh, fill out your session evaluations, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys.